Dear guests, welcome to today's event co-organized by the EU SME Center and the Italy-China Council Foundation, ICCF, Impacts of China's 20th National Party Congress on SMEs. I'm David Orlandi, USME Center in Partnership Coordinator, and I will be uh, leading you into today's meeting that will be uh, uh, partnered uh, by USME Center and ICCF, as I was saying before. Today's speakers are Alessandro Zandro, Head of uh, the Research Department of the Italy China Council Foundation, and Mr. Jakob Brunten, Senior Analyst of the Mercator Institute for the China Studies, Marcos. Before uh, moving on with the presentation, I would like to briefly provide the floor to uh, Mr. Marco Bettin, General Director of ICCF, who unfortunately could not join us here today, but has sent us a brief video uh, with his introductory words. So thank you very much. Good morning and welcome to today's uh, webinar Impacts on China's 20th National Party Congress on Small and Medium Enterprises. This event is organized by Italy China Council Foundation and the EU SME Center. And uh, it will provide an analysis of the impact of the outcomes of the 20th Party Congress um, on European small and medium enterprises. Uh, the partnership uh, between uh, the Italy China Council Foundation and uh, the uh, EU SME Center aimed to provide support and information to European small and medium enterprises in order to ease their Sorry for the techn technical <laughs> problem. I will try again to share the video. Okay. Good morning and welcome to today's uh, webinar Impacts on China's 20th National Party Congress on Small and Medium Enterprises. This event is organized by Italy China Council Foundation and the EU SME Center. And uh, it will provide an analysis of the impact of the outcomes of the 20th Party Congress. Um, all European small and medium enterprises. Uh, the partnership uh, between uh, the Italy China Council Foundation and uh, the uh, EU SME Center aimed to provide support and information to European small and medium enterprises in order to ease their uh, possibility to enter the Chinese market. Analyzing the 20th National Party, we do believe we can understand better what will be the possibilities, the strategies and the tools uh, foreign companies as well as the small European small and medium enterprise can have in order to uh, ease their relationship with the Chinese market. Uh, the conference has just ended and uh, we try to analyze the discussion and the outcomes uh, from the uh, Congress uh, through the help of two speakers. One is uh, Mr. Alessandro Zadro from the Italiana Council Foundation, and the second one uh, is Mr. Jakob Kunt from Merix. Uh, we would like to provide a perception of uh, uh, European uh, needs and the possibility to uh, China and uh, analyzes what came out, uh, what we understood came out from the party congress. We in Italy are very well known about small and medium enterprises. Uh, more than 90% of uh, Italian companies are small and medium enterprises uh, and uh, try to provide tools to those uh, companies. I do believe it is very important, especially uh, to the market such a uh, complex uh, and far like China. The 20th Congress uh, uh, came after a very tough period, uh, coming after uh, the, the spread of the pandemic, COVID and international issues. Therefore, this, uh, the 20th Congress party 
uh, we believe uh, has a strategic uh, um, meaning in this particular moment and uh, understand it will provide us tools and information to try to better uh, assess and to, to better uh, deal with uh, such an important market and an opportunity like China. We try as the Italy China Council Foundation to provide this kind of support to all our members and uh, to the uh, small and medium enterprise from Italy. Through the help of the EU SME Center, we provide also this kind of ser service throughout Europe. Uh, we hope uh, today's webinar will uh, provide uh, interested and strategic information to all of us and I wish uh, all the best for this event. Thank you. Okay, resuming our presentation, as it, as it has been already stated, today's event will see the presence of two different speakers. And the first speech, uh, I will just try to share once again my screen so that you can once again see the presentation. Unfortunately, today we're having some small technical uh, problems. I'm terribly sorry for that, but it should not impact this, uh, this event. So, okay, everybody should be able to once again see my screen with the presentation. As I was saying, we will have two speakers, and the two speeches will be delivered on two different, although uh, directly related topics. The first one is by Minister Alessandro Zadro, uh, who will talk about China, perspective on 2023 after the Congress. And the second one by Mr. Jakob Gunther, who will focus on the impacts of the National Party Congress on EU small and medium enterprises in China. Before giving the floor to the two speakers, I would like to briefly uh, talk about the EU SME Center. This is a program funded by the Single Market Program managed by the EU Commission. Currently in its fourth phase, the program has been running ever since 2010, and its goal is that of supporting EU small and medium companies, entrepreneurs, and startups that decide to enter or expand their activities in China. Uh, the services that the center provides are uh, mainly five. We have the self diagnosis tool, a uh, knowledge pa uh, package, an advice uh, package, training, and advocacy packages. As you can see, all of the services are fundamental for the small and medium enterprises in order to gain uh, total support throughout the entire process of interacting with international trade with China. Uh, for further information, please feel free to reach out to me. Uh, I have left my email address on the chat. And now, without further ado, I would like to give the floor to our first speaker, Mr. Alessandro Zalio from ICCF. Thank you very much. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Davide, for the introduction, for giving me the floor. Uh, I would like to, while I'm trying to share the presentation, I would like to thank the USC Center for uh, organizing this event today. And here we go. And all the audience, of course, is joining us this morning. Let me close a couple of tabs. Okay, thank you. So yeah, um, as you can, um, as you can well, read from the, from the slide, the focus today will be on the impact of China's 20 National Party Congress on small medium enterprises. We uh, kind of divided this uh, webinar in two parts. My parts will be more like broad, so give you uh, uh, some um, follow up on perspectives on 2023 for China uh, after the Congress. And just um, uh, referring to our, um, well, prior to the Congress, we, uh, we brought a, a short uh, analysis uh, we sent it out to our members, ICCF members. So this webinar, my part, is also a follow-up uh, to that uh, document we sent out just to see if the topics we raised, if the suggestions we made were right or wrong. So without further waiting, we'll move to the next slide. Okay, so 
just really like uh, real, uh, um, real brief before moving to the more political and economic side, just uh, give you a couple of information about the Congress, why it's important. The National uh, the Chinese Communist Party National Congress is, well, especially this one, 20, probably definitely the most important political meeting in China in the past 10 years. And according to my well, understanding, uh, past 30 years, given the, the, the well, new, besides new faces, but the new uh, structure, the new uh, um, policies, and the new, uh, um, let's say, uh, ideological perspective that were shared during the Congress. Um, my understanding is that if between um, right after, well, late, early, early mid 80s, up until 2012, 2013, when Xi Jinping uh, came to power, if the, the party uh, legitimization was provided mostly by economic results due to the very sustained economic growth, we've, we've been known in China for its double digit growth. In the past five, six years, this we have seen a sort of switch in terms of legitimization of power, uh, more balanced toward uh, ideology, something that we have perceived uh, during, um, you know, reading through uh, Xi, Jinping, Xi Jinping opening speech during this uh, party congress. Uh, in terms of like uh, terms and concepts that were shared, we see a sort of like, you know, like a better balance in between economy and ideology. Um, so in, in a time of uh, when not only due to COVID-19 uh, uh, zero tolerance and policy, but also to external and internal factors that we'll see later on, uh, economic is not uh, the only you know, uh, 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 way to preserve, keep, that uh, binding uh, link between the state, the party, and the people, but need more ideological and message to uh, keep people closer to the to the government. Why is important the Congress for uh, three main reasons among the many. We have a uh, top leadership changes. We'll see in the next slide. We have might have a uh, um, few more. Um, as inside the party constitution. In China, there are two uh, constitutions. One is the party, one is the state constitution, a very different and probably a different uh, aspect, as you can imagine. And the third reason, we, you know, reading through the, the Xi Jinping um, opening speech and main decisions shared during the week, uh, uh, one week Congress, we, you know, have a grasp on some insights and political economic policy that we got the country at least for the next, the next five years. Uh, as you can see from the um, the big, well, the image here uh, to the right, uh, let's say that, well, the party base moved from a bunch of people in 1921, so a century ago, to up to almost 100 million people in uh, 2021, 2022. And the number of party members, of course, is about 6.7, 6 6.8% of the population. And given by the structure, you might think that um, the central committee uh, elaborate the political role, discuss, and finally the general secretary and the political standing committee take a final decision on new members, on new elections, and so on. Uh, instead, uh, main, major decisions are made well ahead during the year, the beginning of the year, if not before, and then shared to the rest of uh, 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 the, the delegates. So the decisions are made at the center. In the next um, slide will be focusing on the core, on the highest decision uh, the decision making body of the uh, the party in China, which is the the Politburo Standing Committee. Uh, it is made of uh, seven members, uh, including the General Secretary, which is, <laughs> as you already uh, know, to be uh, re-elected, re confirmed for a third time. Uh, President Xi Jinping, in, at least in two of his position as General Secretary of the Party and uh, uh, in charge of the uh, military commission, we'll see if he'll be reelected as the President of the People's the People Republic of China in March 2023 during the two um, sessions. Probably yes, we'll, we'll, we'll have a confirmation on that at the uh, beginning next, next year. So I'm um, just going to share the few, well, the six new, four new and two old faces of the uh, Politburo Standing Committee, including uh, uh, Xi Jinping, who 
by the way, has uh, consolidated uh, uh, power to an extent that we haven't seen since uh, Mao Zedong era. So the first one in terms of, they all rank in terms of importance within the, within the standing committee. So number two is uh, uh, Mr. Li Tian. And I know that um, Mr. Gunther will stress me later on. So I will just mention real quick, as he's 63, used to be the party secretary of Shanghai and is uh, 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 presumed to uh, become a new uh, um, premier during the uh, two sessions in March, 2023. And uh, the number, number, well, number three is Zhao Lu Zi, is 65, is used to be the secretary of the um, Central Commission for Discipline Inspection, which is the, uh, the party's top anti-corruption body. So it's a very important role given how Xi Jinping stressed starting in 2012, the fight against, against corruption. Uh, Zhao Lu Zi together with uh, Mr. Wang Huming, 67, they were both already um, in the previous uh, PDF, PSC, the previous political uh, standing committee. So they were being reconfirmed and actually the scale up in their uh, in, in the political ranking, ranking number uh, third, number four. One for me, well, I, um, I wrote that he's a party political theorist. That's not his, uh, let's say, official role, but he has been known uh, also mostly because of that. Uh, just, just to mention that uh, um, he's the um, he's behind uh, not only but mostly like uh, President Xi Jinping, China Green, and the concept of rejuvenation of the Chinese nation. Number uh, five, we have uh, Tsai Chi, uh, 66 years old, party secretary of Beijing. Uh, to mention two facts, he um, there were many people betting against his election in the political standing, standing committee, but he's dealing, his handling of uh, COVID situation in Beijing uh, and the, the, the um, uh, successfully planned um, Beijing Winter Olympics in 2022 might have helped him to uh, uh, scale up in the ranking besides the fact that he's always been pretty close to President uh, Xi Jinping. Number six, in uh, Suecia, is 60 years old, director of general office of the CCP. It's a very bureaucratic role, and he's presumed to be the new vice premier. And finally, we have Li Xi, 60 years old, uh, party secretary of Guangdong, uh, former party secretary of Guangdong. He is the new uh, secretary of the uh, powerful anti corruption body, the Central Commission for Discipline Inspection. As you can see, a uh, few things, uh, a couple of things I'd like to um, highlight here before moving to the next slide. Third thing is that this is the first time since 25 years that we have no women whatsoever in the Politburo. The Politburo used to be 25 members, it's 24 now. So being, since there are no women this day, it might, it's probably very, it's very hard, quite impossible that it would be women uh, elected to the, to the Politburo in 2027. And as you can see from um, uh, the role that this six member were playing. On my hand, we do have some definitely part of experience in performance, but more what matters most now is be uh, loyal to C, loyal to uh, C section, and loyalty is more important than popularity, as we will see later on. Uh, talking about how Li Qiang uh, handled the COVID uh, situation in, in, in Shanghai and how his popularity is not what actually is famous for. And yeah, so some keywords, uh, just, a, just a few keywords that came out during this um, uh, 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 Congress. Definitely security, you probably already heard about that, security that could be understood in different ways, definitely have territorial security, as we've seen more and more and more pressing issues for China uh, in terms also of sovereignty, international security, in terms of the, uh, the great opportunities that China could join once uh, uh, take advantage of are slowly uh, fading away in terms of like, uh, um, Finding a welcoming environment outside. At least this is what I what I uh, perceive through the uh, government speeches. So it's a time of 
uh, internal and domestic looking, inward looking, social security, in, in, indeed, in terms of also of welfare, food, and data security. Since 2017, uh, China has been uh, dealing a lot with data, how to secure data, how to protect data, uh, mostly free, through uh, three new laws, um, cybersecurity law, data security law, and the personal information protection law. So how to deal with data, how to protect them, how to uh, make data one, an important engine, an important driver for Chinese growth. And then we'll see later on manpower, not only in terms of manufacturing, but in terms of talent, of course. And other um, terms, uh, modernization slash rejuvenation of the Chinese nation. I put three years here, uh, 2021, 20, uh, 2035, and 2049, uh, three important milestones, steps in uh, Chinese rise as a, a new uh, great power. In 2021, China reached the uh, uh, moderately prosperous society, meaning that in, in Chinese terms, they sort of uh, um, eradicate absolute poverty, and it was the first centenary goal. By 2035, China will have to reach uh, sort of like prosperous, uh, well, prosperous society um, by doubling its uh, per capita uh, GDP and by increasing enormously the, 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 um, the pool of people, the pool of uh, citizens within the middle income group. And by 2049, uh, meaning the second centenary goal, uh, China will have to become a strong, prosperous, uh, modern um, country. So basically, uh, 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 finally achieve the rejuvenation of the Chinese nation and uh, um, uh, uh, go back to uh, cover the, the, the role that, you know, uh, that you know, uh, uh, China was covering before the century of rejuvenation started in the 19th century. So being a uh, first uh, world uh, power in under many, many, many aspects. We've been hearing a lot about common prosperity, definitely in the first, the second half of last year. Then the terms slowly disappear before coming out again, coming up again in, in the last uh, Congress. So we're gonna maybe focus on that later on, just to mention that common prosperity is a way to, we're still waiting for uh, uh, detailed guidelines on what that actually means in terms of redistributing, uh, resharing uh, um, uh, wealth among people, but it's some, something in between a blind expansion of business, so uh, no or zero tolerance for, uh, for, for uh, 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 not control the uh, accumulation of wealth, and I perceive a revival of the private sector. Private sector, they might be actually interest for small medium enterprise in China, private sector that is a pool of uh, uh, um, of uh, people, manpower that might actually be joining the middle income group in the next 12, uh, 13 years. And finally, again, the dual circulation that gives us the chance to move to the next slide. Dual circulation, sorry, the slide is in Italian, but it, it's, uh, uh, it was first mentioned in the 14 five year plan a couple of years ago. Dual circulation is a sort of new economic strategy to uh, 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 promote Chinese growth. On one hand, you have an uh, inward looking side um, based on consumption and innovation. And on, an, on the other hand, you have a, a second um, um, cycle, external cycle made of uh, trade and, and, and investment, in and out investment. So, um, yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, so focusing on the economic side, um, uh, top left corner, you see the GDP growth uh, divided by quarter, year over year. Uh, China, uh, Chinese government released the uh, quarter, third quarter data uh, beginning of this week. So uh, we uh, notice a rebound. Um, in um, the economy at a faster, at a faster space, pace than expected. We're supposed to rebound around 3.5, 3.6%, rebound at 3.9, but there are still some distortions and issue that should be uh, um, um, clarified. On one hand, you have, well, first thing first is, uh, well, uh, uh, 
the um, government at the beginning of the year said that the target growth for the for the 2022 was supposed to be 5.5 as you can see we moved from a 4.8 0.4 so almost recession in the second quarter and now 3.9 so we are a bit far from definitely far from the the, the target um, established at the beginning of the year target that it was dropped around june july in order to uh, from, to focus more on the containment of uh, the pandemic and not just on quantitative growth. Major issues among the other, we had a persistent zero carbon policy, a property market slump. The property market in China is worth about 30% of GDP, and then the global recession risk that uh, uh, are really, you know, having a, um, a great cost on Chinese export, for instance, as you can see in the graph below, uh, September export grew only by about 5.6, 5.7%, and the import uh, year over year, and the import were just about 0.2, 0.3%. So it's a it's kind of a, a tricky uh, a, um, situation, especially when export net exports are still uh, not, the, not the main, but still a quite important driver for uh, Chinese economy. Uh, if we break down at 3.9% in the uh, growth, GDP growth in the last quarter, uh, we see that 2.1 is final consumption, mostly made by uh, government spending, and 1.1 is net exports, and 0.8 is investment. So the issue with uh, 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 um, um, let's say focusing on consumption as one of the main drivers of Chinese economy is still, still here, going to be here for, for, for the time to come for different reasons, not only for COVID policy, the zero COVID policy, but also because uh, citizens are not really pushed to spend in, uh, in terms of the other thing, they, they do have other things to, you know, to make sure first. They need to focus on welfare, uh, on the welfare, they need to focus on savings in order to cover for medical expenditure, for school, for, so for many other things that might be, need to be uh, solved and taken care of first before actually hoping to see uh, uh, better, better consumption, better spending. And um, yeah, moving on to the next slide, we have a uh, final, final slide focusing on innovation. As we've seen, the domestic driver would be uh, either consumption, uh, consumption and innovation. Innovation in terms of like, research and development is quite it's quite key, important for, for the government. It's been stressed also during the, the Congress, the way, of course, to achieve modernization. And research and investment in 2021 were plus 14% uh, um, year over year, or about 2.44% of uh, GDP. And the target between now and 2025 would be to achieve uh, year over year growth of about 7%. There is, as you can see uh, on the right, chart a uh, pretty strong imbalance between how investments are made into research. 83 goes to uh, uh, experimental research, 11% applied research, and only about 6% in basic research. The goal is to, by 25, to, re to uh, raise the uh, uh, ex expenditure in, uh, uh, applied in uh, uh, um, basic research to 7.58%. Uh, in terms of sectors, uh, we do have the, well, I've broken down among many others, but a lot of like, they're stressing a lot of space exploration, nuclear physics, quantum science, and biological engineering. Uh, before concluding, uh, another key word that actually was mentioned quite a few times during the World War II Congress is the um, fostering and attraction of talents, uh, fostering uh, domestic. Uh, point of view and attracting from the outside, mostly to pardon, exclusively to be included in this uh, in the into the outline uh, sectors. Uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. Just to give you an overview on what has been said and some you know uh, uh, um, uh, just insights for later on discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alessandro. And I would like to give the floor now to Mr. Jan Gunther that will provide the second presentation of this webinar.
Very good. I'm trying to share my screen right now. Can you see that? Perfect. Okay. So um, uh, many thanks to Alessandro for giving us that, that big picture perspective. Uh, I'll try now to kind of zoom in and um, provide some analysis on what I think this means for European SMEs um, in terms of their relationship with China, um, either as investors or as trading partners. So um, just as kind of an overview, um, starting from the big messaging, which is that Xi Jinping, um, you know, gave a clear message of continuity of, of the policies that he's pursued in the last five and 10 years, but especially the last two or three. Um, now, continuity does not mean just, you know, oh, more of the same and nothing really changes. This is continuity for an extremely ambitious um, rebalancing of, of the economy and a, and a shift in the relationship between the companies and the government and the party. Um, so in many ways, that's going to mean a lot of the challenges that, S that European SMEs have felt in recent years um, are going to continue, but that doesn't mean that there aren't plenty of opportunities um, available to smaller companies. So um, three kind of main points that I'm going to focus on. Um, first is that you know, China is going to continue with zero COVID policy for some time. Um, we see this kind of clean sweep of the Politburo, uh, meaning that his, uh, the Politburo and the Politburo Standing Committee that is now entirely composed of Xi loyalists um, means that his priorities and ideology really reign supreme. And at the center of that in, in the last couple of years is the zero COVID policy. Um, as when that started to become clearly a success compared to the rest of the world, when China was able to kind of effectively close its border and, and mitigate any further spread. And then as the rest of the world sort of slipped into chaos, this became Xi Jinping's sort of signature domestic policy. And it's a powerful message that he's been promoting that, you know, the Chinese Communist Party, unlike other governments, first and foremost, protects people's lives. Um, and it's going to be really difficult for him to back away from that anytime soon. Um, and the fact that there aren't any, you know, real sort of opposition members um, uh, or other faction members um, in the Politburo or in the Standing Committee suggests that there, there's not going to be any real meaningful internal pushback. Um, the second point is that uh, foreign investors are going to have to really reconcile with um, Xi Jinping's securitization of everything. Um, as Alessandro said, you know, security, security is you know, paramount under Xi Jinping and security doesn't just mean national security, it means economic security, data security, cybersecurity, technological security, all of these things. Um, and that's going to lead to greater technological divergence in terms of a China ecosystem and a rest of the world ecosystem. Um, but also in localization demands, that there's going to be stronger and stronger pushes to get um, uh, companies to onshore their own operations and their own production facilities, um, but also to localize their supply chains, whether that's of, you know, European SMEs that are suppliers to European OEMs needing to, you know, follow that localization demand, um, or of, you know, European companies that are in China choosing local partners um, rather than importing um, from, from SMEs uh, and suppliers in Europe that are Europe-based. Um, there's also the tight data governance aspects um, uh, that we can discuss a little bit as well. Um, so, uh, in, and then finally, uh, looking in at the European SMEs and the opportunities and risks um, that they see uh, under Xi Jinping's third term after this party Congress, um, and that really it's the, the, the risk versus opportunity is going to be extremely focused on the technological components. Um, to what degree uh, a European SME can position itself as a technology provider to advance China's strategic goals of technological self-reliance um, and, and innovation. Um, that's where the red carpet is going to be rolled out. And in other areas, um, the strategic value is going to be, you know, a, far, far less important if there isn't the technological components. So starting with, um, uh, I won't spend so much time on this because Alessandro quickly covered um, uh, the, the personnel aspect, but Li Chang is going to almost certainly replace Li Keqiang as premier. Um, this is, uh, in, an, in a broad sense, probably not great news. Li Keqiang was an incredibly competent um, administrator. Uh, Li Chang seems to be somewhat competent, but he won't have the capacity to be able to push back on the worst inclinations of Xi Jinping the way Li Keqiang clearly was able to. Um, and he won't have the same kind of autonomy that Li Keqiang had. 
even though that was, to be frank, limited for, for, for Vika Chang. But when I look at his experience here in his career, um, you know, Li Chang rose out of Zhejiang province um, and his, his experience in that province overlaps with um, the success of Zhejiang as sort of this, this really powerful province for small and medium-sized enterprises. Um, uh, if, if there's anywhere that's going to produce the kind of middle stand companies that Xi Jinping is so eager to create, um, it's going to be a place like Zhejiang, um, where historically they have just flourished, um, but also a place like Zhejiang where you had not only the SME aspect, but you had the, the great sort of tech and uh, you know, innovation hub of Hangzhou um, and the ecosystems that were built up there. So in that sense, his Zhejiang experience might suggest that Li Chang is going to have a more optimistic view about the role of SMEs and not just of SMEs as providing employment and, you know, high value um, production and such, but also of their role in relation to a broader ecosystem um, uh, that you, you don't get um, some of the tech giants that emerge in Hangzhou without also having a lot of other startups and SMEs within that ecosystem. Um, so that, that could be promising news. Um, similarly, uh, you know, the, his entire exper career experience is all in the Jiangnan region. So Zhejiang, Jiangsu, and Shanghai. And these are all areas that are considered very friendly to foreign investment. So um, this, again, this, this could suggest that Li Chang will be not only a, kind of a pro SME guy, but also maybe a pro foreign investment guy. Um, the, the one big black spot uh, of, of his career is, as Alessandro said, um, his leadership over Shanghai. Um, which overall was probably pretty good, um, but became really disastrous during the COVID lockdown earlier this year. Um, but again, the fact that Li Chang, that that was not a disqualifying incident um, to become premier, says that this is more, he is more an ideological and a loyalty kind of choice um, than just a pure meritocratic, technocratic choice um, for Xi Jinping. So that does, again, limit the ability for Li Chang to push back the way that Li Keqiang would have been able to. Also important, um, he's not on the Politburo Standing Committee, but he's on the Politburo, is He Lifeng. Um, he's almost certainly going to be replacing Liu He as the sort of economic czar. Um, and He Lifeng has uh, an interesting career as well. Um, he, you know, Li Chang rose out of Zhejiang, He Lifeng rose out of Fujian. Um, and that's, you know, where he got his ties to, to Xi Jinping. Um, and again, we're talking about a you know, one of these southern coastal provinces, there's a greater sense of openness to foreign um, ideas and foreign investments um, uh, that's, that could be quite positive um, from a European SME perspective. Um, and that he, he seems to have done a pretty competent job of running um, uh, the different uh, administration or the different jurisdictions that he was in control of during that time. Um, quite importantly, though, when we get to 2009 to 2012, when he was... Um, uh, helping run things in Tianjin, this overlaps with uh, a not so bright spot in his career. Um, that's he was put in charge of the Binhai economic special economic uh, area or new economic zone, um, which uh, anyone who's been to Tianjin uh, can identify as a place uh, with that's almost like a super advanced ghost city. Um, uh, you know, incredible amounts of investment went in, lots of construction, lots of activity. Um, uh, to develop that new area. But um, when you walk around there in, in the evening, uh, there aren't very many lights on in the buildings. Um, so, uh, and as, as would later come out that, you know, there was this mirage of an economic miracle in Tianjin um, that later on turned out to be falsification of data um, and the hiding of a lot of uh, uh, kind of sketchy, sketchy stuff going on. Um, to the extent that He Lifeng was responsible for any of that, we may never know, um, but, that is nonetheless a, a black mark there. Um, but otherwise, you know, he's been running the NDRC for the last five years. Um, uh, so he's going to have this real prioritization of kind of a more state-led model of development um, uh, from the NDRC perspective, as compared to a more uh, sort of market-oriented one that you'd get from the Ministry of Commerce. Um, but that aligns really well with Xi Jinping's idea about a top-down, you know, whatever it takes to close the technology gap, whatever industrial policy needs to be advanced. Um, and in that sense, maybe there's an openness in Holy Fung to seeing the uh, value that European um, SMEs can bring as technology providers. So moving on to the 
sort of localization and securitization of everything that Xi Jinping so emphasized throughout the party Congress. Um, what we see is that there's this broader push um, for European companies and foreign companies in general to localize as much as possible while they can. Um, so this is some data from uh, uh, the European Business Confidence, the European Chamber's Business Confidence Survey. Um, I'm also just realizing uh, I failed to update this to the one from this year, but it's very similar um, in that there's a, there are a lot more companies onshoring their supply chains um, and their operations into China than there are offshoring. Um, and that is intrinsically connected with this localization effort and the technological localization. Effort. Um, so when we talk about sort of economic security and the cyber and data security aspects, these all sort of um, intersect um, in, this, in this localization drive. And there are a couple of different issues that European SMEs will have to deal with under this broader securitization and localization umbrella. Um, in which we have the CII, the Critical Information Infrastructure Rule Set. Um, this, you know, this has been uh, a, a really aggressive point of, of um, you know, an, an aggressive priority of Xi Jinping in the last couple of years. And this is part of the our tech crackdown, is this whole cyber and data um, security aspect. Um, so you have the Critical Information Infrastructure, whether you are a supplier of network equipment or services as an SME, uh, that's bad news for you because there's a, an extreme push to choose local options. Um, whether you're a critical information infrastructure operator, which falls into these 14 different categories, um, that's going to require extensive choices about localizing, um, getting rid of your, your European and foreign suppliers of a lot of that network equipment and digital services and choosing Chinese versions to, to comply with those rules. Um, and then we have this other thing, this ANC, um, it's the Autonomous and Controllable Campaign. And this is a much broader sense of localizing not just your technology, not just your network equipment and services, but a much broader self-reliance campaign of, you know, companies are being pushed to choose suppliers that are based in China. So that doesn't necessarily mean no foreign companies, but it does mean less importing, more local sourcing. Um, and to show what that kind of looks like, um, there's this chart here. Um, so there's the network supplier rules and the operator rules for the critical information infrastructure set. And then there's the autonomous and controllable campaign. And we can see where they overlap. Um, so if you're a network equipment or services supplier, you fit in one and two. I'm sorry to the SMEs out there that this is their line of business. There's probably not a very good future for you in China. There's a really extensive push to localize and choose Chinese um, suppliers, um, including in foreign companies. On the network operator rule sets, um, uh, that's going to be in financial services, for example. Um, this localization push means gutting a lot of your equipment um, and uh, that network equipment choosing and replacing it with local supplies. But very importantly, almost, almost all SMEs and almost all companies are not going to necessarily fit under those two rule sets at the moment. Um, at the moment, they're mostly going to be falling under this autonomous and controllable self-reliance campaign that Xi Jinping has been pushing. But as more and more industries integrate smart technology and the internet of things and the networking of everything, there's a higher likelihood that more and more of those companies are going to start following on, falling under those network operator rules. Um, so it's really important if you're a European SME in China to try to stay ahead on these things and keep an eye out that as you become more digitalized and more networked, um, there's going to be greater and greater compliance risks um, as a result of Xi Jinping's securitization of everything. And then lastly, um, looking at some of the, the kind of opportunities um, and risks, um, uh, forgive the, the kind of overload of, of text and stuff on this chart, but um, it's, it's really important to figure out where you fit in Beijing's plans and Xi Jinping's plans, and then how you as a company decide to respond to that. Um, so uh, we have these different kind of archetypes and benchmarks um, that's, that we've been working on here at Merix. Um, and this is a preview for a, a project that we're hoping to, to release later next year. So um, uh, try, try not to spin this around too much. But um, so we, we have in this, a uh, green column uh, from China's view, these are key technology providers for its self-reliance push and industrial upgrade. Um, and then we have in the, the yellow, the useful tech and know-how or growth and employment providers. So 
you know, companies that are nice to have um, around and provide good jobs and growth, but they aren't really um, hitting the technological side. And then in the red column, we have the companies that basically this is where China has closed the technology gap and foreign, foreign competitors are no longer welcomed. Um, and it's really important if you're in that category that you recognize that you're in that category um, and that you don't try to double down into China and you instead think about, um, you know, how do you maximize the opportunities you still have in the market while not further exposing yourself to those risks? Um, but I think the most important thing here is, is this, this green column. Um, so a lot of European SMEs have, you know, extremely advanced technologies that Beijing is really eager to get. Um, they may not recognize the importance of that technology um, because, if you're, because if you're from a smaller company, um, you know, maybe you're not so well known and you don't have the reputation. But um, if you're able to position yourself accordingly, um, you can push yourself into this kind of leverager position in the top left that if, if you're far enough ahead, technologically speaking, and you're not worried about the tech leakage risks and you're confident you can stay ahead of your Chinese competitors, um, if you want to increase your investment in China and onshore some of that production, um, you can, you should be able to leverage your position and get better conditions from the governments in doing so, um, rather than just sort of taking whatever um, the, the, the standard is. Um, however, beyond just kind of the investment perspective, it's really important for SMEs to look at the, the risks and opportunities of an investment-driven strategy versus an export-driven strategy. Um, just because Beijing rolls out the red carpet for you does not mean you have to walk down it. Um, you could choose to maintain your technological security um, by not investing in production of your cutting edge materials in, uh, in China and instead have an export strategy. Um, this, this will become more and more challenging because of that localization effort. But if you have something that's really unique that Beijing needs, um, you may be able to uh, stay in that position for, uh, for quite some time. Um, so yeah, maybe we can jump into this in the Q&A um, uh, since I don't want to take up any more time, but um, really thinking about a, a kind of comprehensive China strategy of knowing exactly where you fit into Xi Jinping's plans after his party Congress and after his securing of power um, and thinking about your response as a company. Um, uh, and yeah, uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and leave it at that. And I guess we'll jump into the Q&A. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this speech uh, that showed how China is still a very relevant uh, market for EU SMEs and how there's still a uh, desire for EU SMEs uh, uh, expertise in the Chinese market. Coming back to the uh, presentation, we are now opening the floor for the Q&A session. And uh, the first question that we have is, well, the $1 million dollar question. Uh, we are asked if there's any foreseeable change in the zero COVID policy to revamp the economy and attract again investment. I know this has been touched upon in both presentations, but if either of you would like to spend a few more words on this subject. Yeah, I'll go first. Uh, yes, please, <laughs> Alessandro. <laughs> <laughs> well, now that I know, honestly, I've seen actually a lot of support still like in, during the Congress or recently uh, for the results achieved by the zero carbon policy. And so far, we have, from my understanding, we have no, uh, well, there are no perceivable changes uh, to this uh, policy in the month to come. We've seen a little bit of opening here and there to students from the other side or some new agency opening up in a few cities in China that are, you know, supposedly promote some outbound tourism, but I don't see that honestly as a big change. And uh, there are still many cities uh, affected by COVID policies, your policies as we speak. And yeah, it's my understanding. Also, yeah, also, as, 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 sorry, just so not one last, also uh, linking that uh, the success of, since the zero value policy is a C policy, more or less, linking how successful it has been according to C in containing and save life. Still, since COVID is still an issue in China, I don't see that any open uh, anytime soon, since, you know, yeah, there would probably, you know, a raising number of, uh, affected people or that might uh, hinder uh, C position these days, even if he 
the aquifer uh, further. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I would echo all of that. And, and just also add that China is in a really difficult position in this, and that it doesn't have the hospital space, it doesn't have the the advanced kind of healthcare systems that that made, even though COVID was running rampant, continues to run rampant in places like Germany and Italy, um, that made that a bit more bearable. Um, so <clears throat> at some point, China will have to rip off the Band-Aid, um, and it's going to be incredibly painful and incredibly difficult. But I mean, if we thought the disruptions from the lockdowns were bad, um, when that when that big wave finally hits, it's going to be incredibly disruptive to China's economy and to the global economy. Um, so I'm a little bit sympathetic to the position that they're in. I still think that their strategy is is kind of fundamentally flawed, and that they're just kicking the can down the road and suffering the the consequences of lockdowns again and again. They're not doing enough to push the vaccines. Um, they're not willing to import foreign mRNA vaccines and things like this. Um, so there are a lot of issues with that strategy. But um, from the perspective of some cadre in the Chinese Communist Party, the zero COVID policy compared to the alternative of, you know, widespread infection um, is it's a slow burning fuse that they have to deal with rather than, you know, a, a singular quick, huge explosion. Um, and we have to always remember the CCP is first and foremost, a stability-oriented party. Thank you very much. Uh, moving on, we have a very uh, specific question uh, that I would say falls directly into Jakob Gunther area. Uh, we are asked how to secure a sustainable position in the Chinese market as a tech SME uh, accessing the Chinese market indeed for the first time. I know this is very, <laughs> this is a very specific question, uh, possibly a bit hard to, to reply to. Maybe we might uh, generalize uh, and uh, assessing how to build a sustainable position in the Chinese market for a small and medium enterprise. Yeah, I mean that's that's a really tricky question, <laughs> um, especially not not knowing more um, about the company specifically. But um, I mean, in in general. First off, there will, of course, be the difficulty of trying to start up um, operations in China with the zero COVID policy. When it's difficult to get there, it's difficult to set things up um, and it's unpredictable. So now is maybe not the best time. Um, but the second point would be that um, if, if China is going to be your first foreign market outside of Europe, um, I would say, honestly, think again. Um, go get some experience in other markets uh, with, other, with other systems before you try to take on you know, China specifically, um, which is a whole different kind of beast. Um, and it would be really difficult to make that your second market after the European market. Um, uh, but beyond that, I mean, it's, it's really important to, um, as, as, a, as an SME and a tech supplier, to develop really close partnerships with um, the, companies that, the companies or the consumers that you're going to be selling to. So. Um, whether that's a European or other foreign OEM that you're going to be working with, or whether it's Chinese OEMs, um, it's really imperative to stick close to them and build a trusting relationship, um, not only because of, you know, standard business stuff, but as an SME, you're just not going to have the resources to be able to keep up with the compliance and the cha constant change in government affairs and the constant need to be in communication with the government. Um, whereas the big OEMs, they have, you know, armies of people on all these different teams. SMEs might have one or two people that have that, those things as part of their portfolio. So it's really, really critical to stick to your partners in that sense, um, to, to fulfill that sort of compliance and government affairs and intelligence gathering role, um, uh, and to, to kind of bring you under, under your wing. Um, and then the last thing is just be really, really careful about your IP. Um, uh, the IP system in China has gotten steadily better on patents. It's not gotten very much better on trade secrets. Um, so depending on what kind of technology and know-how you bring, make sure that you're protecting it accordingly. You're making sure you're getting all your patents uh, correctly. Um, but also just have a really hard think about what technology do you actually need to bring to that market? Um, because as an SME, you probably only have a few product lines and a few core technologies. And you can't afford to lose one or two of them the same way that a big multinational might be able to afford to lose one or two of its technologies of a portfolio of hundreds of hundreds of thousands of products. So um, yeah, have a look at your Chinese competitors and think to yourself, 
do I need to bring my most cutting edge technology and risk technology leakage and theft by investing in that, by putting that in the market? Or can I bring my second or third generation technology instead? Um, and then just keep, you know, bring in stuff that keeps you one step ahead of your Chinese competitors, but you don't necessarily need to be two or three steps ahead. Um, yeah, so just again, uh, res resist the red carpet treatment if it's not right for you. Thank you very much. Then I would like to take maybe a final question before closing the Q&A session. Uh, we have a very general uh, question about the uh, investment climate in China. Uh, I would like to ask maybe the, both of you to provide a very, I know this is pretty much what we've been discussing already throughout the uh, presentations, but maybe to spend a quick uh, comment on this, uh, on this topic. So what is your perception of the current investment climate in the Chinese market? So Alessandro, if you yeah. would like to go first. Yeah, just very brief. Uh, and like past year, uh, even recently, China has been uh, like relaxing a bit on some like negative list on one side. On the other side, I see, uh, you know, there's always this um, issue of, um, as we like to frame it in Europe, of uh, Lack of reciprocity, I mean, like, you know, like a lack of uh, uh, reciprocity in entering Chinese market, especially the condition in our companies, not only SMEs, has, has, has to be, or have to face while entering, investing, and working in China. Other issue might be not just um, challenging in terms of entering the market, or challenging in terms of staying in the market, because we think, you know, as um, Jacob was saying earlier, there's a increasing competition by local. Uh, competitors, local companies that might actually change your investment, your strategy, your products in China. And this is a very, I know, broad uh, topic, broad uh, concept, but still, um, through a few surveys that we conducted in the past three years, we understand that Chinese production, Chinese uh, component, Chinese goods are uh, quite challenging in terms of like um, increasingly challenging in terms of quality. And then my, you know, hinder the, the investment uh, perspective for some for some of our companies. Also, an issue, well, as Italian, I would say, uh, but I guess that will could probably be, be be shared by other countries in the EU. We, but mostly as Italian, we really uh, face it's well. China is not a market for everyone. It's a pretty challenging market, as you as you might understood so far. And we present ourselves, we do it under China as a single, small, medium enterprise, it's kind of impossible, very hard to, 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 to survive if not, if you don't uh, stay in that green uh, area that, that um, uh, Jakob was showing earlier. And we might actually, this is an advice, but just an idea to, you know, try to uh, put the strengths together and try to enter China as a more stable group of companies uh, 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 and you know to 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 actually uh, have better chances to uh, face it uh, but yeah then then there's also all that uh, ideological or um, uh, values uh, you know uh, things going on between the EU and China that might actually complicate life for companies but I will put this as a the last uh, the last issue uh, just more diplomatic side. Yeah. Thank you very much. And yeah, please. Yeah, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll try my best to be brief, but I, I can only promise so much. <laughs> um, so yeah, the, the overall investment climate, um, I mean, Alessandro is right to kind of look at it from a unilateral perspective of what Beijing wants, and then the bilateral and multilateral perspectives um, of you know, a, an increasingly complicated relationship between Europe and its member states and China, um, but also, frankly, the US and China, because um, I know we're speaking mainly to SMEs here, but uh, a lot of SMEs, their, their, sec their, their first market is Europe, their second market is the United States, and then their third market becomes China. Um, and by having a footprint in the US, what happens in the US and China matters um, and affects European SMEs. But um, from that unilateral perspective, uh, it's I mean, obviously, the zero COVID and the kind of decreasing and lagging growth, um, that's that's all uh, going to have negative impacts on investor sentiment. 
Um, but from Beijing's unilateral perspective, I think a lot of times we hear about how China is closing up, and it is politically, it's not economically. Um, it, it wants to localize, it wants to onshore as much as possible. Um, but the, the vision that they have is not one of trying to just get rid of all the foreign companies as soon as possible. Um, there's, there's still plenty of opportunities for, for foreign investment. Again, it's really about knowing where you sit um, in relation to China's strategic goals. Um, but then, yeah, the, the bilateral and multilateral aspect um, is, is really key because um, when, when we look at you know, the increasing conflict, or not conflict, but frictions between the EU and China on human rights, or the bilateral tips between like Lithuania and China over Taiwan, um, uh, you know, we right now are having all sorts of diplomatic tips over these Chinese like PRC police stations that apparently have been found in several European countries, these secret police stations. Um, heck, this morning in response to Costco's investment um, goals in uh, the port of Hamburg, apparently um, the foreign ministry in Belgium had said, made some remarks that upset the Chinese government. And the Chinese government was apparently pushing the Belgian government to censor newspaper reports about this. Like every day there's something else going on and every single one of these things adds on a little bit more to the, the, the sort of frictions, <clears throat> frictions that exist. And we, we know that Beijing is not afraid of using economic coercion to try to um, send a message. And whether that's that you're a, an SME with close ties um, or from you know, Lithuania and you suddenly found yourself, your exports to China cut off as a result of that diplomatic friction, or if it's that you are H&M and you decided to, um, you know, uh, you know, forgo using cotton from Xinjiang, um, all, all of these things, and then ultimately H&M got punished um, severely by, by Chinese consumers and, and um, propaganda, the propaganda apparatus, like these risks exist. And for a lot of SMEs, you'll be able to kind of fly under the radar and probably be okay. Um, but at the same time, if you're an SME that isn't super technologically important, um, you might be on the chopping block rather than hitting like a big OEM. Um, it might be less expensive for Beijing to hit you than to hit your OEM customer. Um, and then of course, there's the US with the kind of open economic warfare we've seen emerge in the last couple of weeks with um, between the CHIPS Act uh, and then the export controls and US persons um, limitations. Um, that, that's only going to get worse. Um, I'm afraid to say so to the degree that European SMEs are connected to um, the United States as a market or as a um, as an export market or as an investment market um, or as a, or as a technology supplier um, that increases the likelihood that you'll fall under US long arm jurisdiction um, and again it's it's really messy already it's probably just going to get messier on that bilateral and multilateral front which again is why it's really worth investing in um, the intelligence side of things and the compliance side of things um, and all these different markets and making sure that you're really close with your, um, your uh, OEM kind of customers that they help you to navigate that as well. Thank you very much. Before uh, closing this presentation, I would like to actually take a very final question uh, given the relevance of the sector. We are asked uh, where will small and medium enterprises from the food and beverage sector uh, fall into the nine quadrants? Uh, so uh, I see that your presentation Jakob, has been uh, <laughs> extremely interesting and has led to very different questions. And uh, we are also asked uh, what would be our advice to proceed in the next year for this uh, sector? This might be uh, asking for a bit too much, <laughs> but it would be definitely interesting to assess what is your perception for this sector, given how relevant it is as of now. Thank you very much. Yeah, well, I mean, I know I focus really heavily on the technology aspect, but the underlying argument of that is that you need to find a way to fit yourself into Xi Jinping's strategic goals. And one of those strategic goals is, um, as, as Alessandro pointed out, is this idea of dual circulation. Um, that China wants to become less reliant on exports and more reliant on domestic consumption. 
Um, and to the degree that you can contribute to as, a, as an F&B exporter to China, the, to the degree that you can contribute to, you know, enhancing domestic consumption, um, but also frankly, of like boosting China's food security and its food, its food diversification, import diversification strategies, like there, there, there are still strategic goals that, that an F&B company can align with. Um, it'll be a little trickier as an SME rather than as like one of the big food trader companies. But again, maybe it's worth looking into partnering with one of those bigger um, you know, food traders um, to, to think about how, how you can sort of not sneak in, but kind of slide in underneath their, their bigger wings um, to, to gain access to the market and to, to kind of leverage yourself in, in that position. Um, but also, frankly, as an F&B company, like that keeps you away from a lot of the technological sensitivity um, and, and sensitive areas. Um, you won't really have to worry about like localization of your network operators and supply or, or equipment and, and service providers, um, the way that a lot of companies that are investing in production facilities in China would. Um, the, the last point that I'll add, though, is that F&B is particularly vulnerable to um, the, the bilateral relations and economic coercion com complexities. Um, you know, when, when you look at when China sort of punishes um, a, a foreign country rather than a foreign company that has done something wrong, but rather a foreign country that has done something wrong. With Canada, what did they go for? They owned the canola exports. With Australia, they went for barley, wine, lobster, cheese, meat, things like this. Um, and it's, it's really easy to hit those exports because they're not super essential to China's national strategic interests um, at, at, at a broad level. Um, but also, you know, governments are responsive to their farmers um, and, and to their, you know, to their farmers and people that, you know, raise, raise and process meats um, uh, that make wine, things like this. So um, there's an additional exposure there, but there's much less exposure on the technology front. So. Um, again, there are opportunities. Um, it's about how you position yourself and how you you uh, sort of analyze and, and calculate those risks. Thank you very much. Alessandro, would you like to add something on that? Yeah, just uh, just a digression. I really want to really brief as the Italian, you know, we do have this made in Italy. <laughs> Fair enough, because we know the question comes from an Italian uh, you know, participant, but we do have this percent. Well, we see when well, we're looking at data from 2020 and 2021, and our export of food and beverage to China has been growing quite, you know, has been you know, reaching quite important um, growth rate. And that's because, you know, not only, well, not only because of the quality of, of our production, our exports in terms of wine, in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of um, food, for instance, now we are the third. Uh, exporter of wine to China in terms of market share. Why? We were supposed to be fourth, but due to the, all the, the sanctions toward Australian wine, we ranked third. So, so this mix a little, you know, mix up a little bit with uh, what uh, Jakob was saying earlier about how easy it is to target like something that might not be quite uh, important or fundamentally, you know, just like wine. But one thing is the quality of what we export and the, the needs that Chinese population have especially in the past uh, couple of years, two to three years. On one hand, you have a population is getting richer and richer, so you need to, they might actually, uh, they can afford more uh, pricey and more, you know, with a higher quality uh, uh, rate of food and beverage and so on. On the other hand, you have population is switching towards new type of products, more biological products, more uh, uh, healthier products, and they might want to look, you know, to uh, uh, importing, Food, food, and, and and goods from abroad, just like many other many other products. And yes, this falls also into the that the circulation strategy. Need uh, inward looking, but also that external cycle of uh, trade, which is still uh, and is going to be pretty important for the years to come. So yeah, it really depends on where you. It's a niche market. It really depends where you, uh, you know, what your product is, who your target is, but. There are and my, well, my bias is that there are a, well, huge opportunities for the food and beverage sector in China in the years to come. Not only for uh, just uh, last thing, last thing, not only for uh, human, let's say, but also for just for instance for pets as well. We see a, a huge uh, 
uh, raised in terms of like exporting of pets, food, pet things towards China. That's a really another niche market that might be uh, of interest for someone. Uh, thank you. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much to the both of you. It has been an uh, extremely interesting event. I saw that, uh, Jakub, uh, would you like to add something? I saw that you had... Uh... Yeah, just, just one quick little thing. I, I added it into the Q&A, but in, in case uh, either the person asking the question missed it or, or others are interested in the F&B side, um, don't forget that I, I know the whole world forgot about it because uh, um, everyone was crushed when the comprehensive agreement on investment failed to go through. But the EU and China did sign that agreement on geographical indications. So there are a hundred different European geographical identifications in that agreement that are now protected, protected classes in China. Um, so to make sure to look through that list, like maybe some of the um, the, the F and B exports that you're sending to China fit under that and are you know able to get that protection um, and therefore that kind of marketing enhancement. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, as I was saying, uh, it has been great to have the both of you here with us today. This has been an extremely interesting event, as we can see also from the amount of questions. Unfortunately, uh, we have not been able to reply to all of them, but I believe that. Uh, both speakers have been extremely clear in presenting the impacts of the uh, Chinese Congress on the uh, use money of human enterprises. So once again, thank you very much to the both of you. Before uh, officially closing this webinar, uh, I would like to ask the participants to please uh, help us improve the services of the USME Center by taking a quick survey that can be accessed by scanning the QR code that you can find on this slide. And after that, I would like to once again uh, thank all the participants to this uh, presentation, our speakers, uh, Merix, the ICCF, and the USM Center. Uh, USM Center and the ICCF as organizers of the event. And once again, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much to the speakers. Thank you very much to the participants. I hope we will have the opportunity to meet uh, soon enough, either in person or to another online event. Thank you to everybody and have a nice day. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.